Okay, I think we'll begin the webinar now. Um, welcome everyone to the Improving Client Outcomes, the Role of Behavioral Finance webinar. My name is Marshall Beyer, and I am a Senior Director at the Canadian Securities Institute. And I will just take a moment to introduce this webinar and the speaker. Speakers, sorry. First, I'm obligated to say that information contained herein are statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities or to provide any legal or tax advice. We ask that no one record this webinar without Moody's explicit written permission. Lastly, no one has permission to quote any of the comments made or questions asked by the webinar audience. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the CSI website in coming days. All members of the audience are currently on mute. If you have a question, and we do encourage you to ask it, please type it in the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. Our speakers will answer the questions after the initial presentation, which will last around 30 to 40 minutes. We ask that you please keep your questions as generic as, pos as possible and avoid personal or client-specific information. Benjamin Graham, known as the father of value investing, once said many decades ago that an investor's worst problem, even worst enemy, is likely to be him or herself. He made this remark well before the emergence of the field of behavioral finance, which is a field of study that has revealed that market participants are influenced by cognitive and emotional biases, and those biases tend to make them do things that are at times irrational, such as taking profits earlier or holding on to losing positions. And I think we could all relate to that. Whereas st standard finance is about logic and numbers and ratios and rationality, behavioral finance experts have collected and documented evidence of investors' irrational behavior and errors in financial judgment, which repeat over and over again. The study of behavioral finance has gained greater and greater recognition and importance in the investment community over the years, particularly as a way for advisors to gain even deeper insight into their clients in order to help them manage their biases and achieve their financial goals. We are extremely fortunate to have two excellent speakers here today, representing their organizations that are deeply into the behavioral finance space. First, we have Shannon O'Malley, PhD, who is head of client experience at BeWorks. BeWorks is a company that applies behavioral science insights and methods across many industries, including the financial industry, to improve business, policy, and human outcomes. Shannon is an experienced practitioner and has applied behavioral finance to solve challenges in a variety of sectors. She has led numerous complex and impactful behavior change initiatives in financial services and beyond. As head of client experience, as head of client experience, Shannon continues to apply her passion for helping clients apply behavioral science by creating engaging and informative content through workshops, speaking events, reports, and other outlets. Over her career, she has developed and taught advanced level courses on psychology and behavior at Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto and at the University of Waterloo. Prior to BeWorks, Shannon earned her PhD in cognitive psychology at the University of Waterloo. We also are very fortunate to have Brian Hasselich, who was Chief Executive Officer of Syntonic, which is an organization that provides behavioral finance technology solutions, consulting and research all of which is ultimately designed to help grow stronger and deeper and more profitable client relationships through behavioral client engagement, thus proving, improving client outcomes. Brian has coached, trained, and supported more than 1,000 financial advisors, earning top advisor retention leader and top recruiter awards multiple times in a row. Additionally, he serves as a senior mentor with Founder Institute, New York City, Seattle, and Silicon Valley, where he has mentored more than 20 cohorts and 300 founders during the past eight years. Before he entered the world of finance, Brian served as a flight para paramedic with the US Army Reserve and two SWAT teams. So without further delay, I'm very pleased to hand the presentation over to Shannon, who will start things off. Shannon? Terrific. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Marshall. And I, I know I speak on behalf of Brian as well when I say we're, we're very excited to be here both very excited, very passionate about behavioral finance and speaking about how it can be applied in the real world to help advisors really optimize outcomes for, for clients. I want to start with a pretty simple question. 
uh, which is just to just to kick us off and to start reflecting on where this might fit into to your practice. The question is this: What has a bigger impact on outcomes for clients? So long-term outcomes for clients. Is it optimizing portfolios? So thinking about what to invest in, when to buy, when to sell, um, making sure portfolios are diversified, or is it focusing on saving versus spending, helping people put away more money, actually put more assets into those investments in the first place so that they can increase their outcome, their, their savings long term. Now, when you phrase it this way, it starts to become a little bit clearer for most people in most scenarios. Of course, it, it, there's never a scenario that applies to everything. There's never an answer that applies to everything. But for most people, increasing what they're saving in the first place is ultimately going to have a longer, a larger impact on their long-term outcomes, making sure that they're, they're putting away more of those assets that they're acquiring as they go throughout their life uh, so they have more, more to actually invest and more to optimize is where you're gonna have the biggest impact. Now, of course, as advisors, we tend to focus more on optimizing portfolios, the optimizing portfolio side of things. And there's there's good reason for that. Uh, but the reason why I raised this question and why I wanna put this out there is because when we think about behavioral finance and we think about behavioral coaching, it's important to think about treating clients holistically, thinking about both sides of this equation and giving it in consideration to the underlying psychological needs of the clients so that we're really providing advice and guidance in a way that works with how people actually make decisions. Now, if we go to the next slide, before I get into what behavioral finance is and some of the, the nuances there, I just wanna to touch on why this might matter, why this might be valuable to consider. Uh, at BE Works, we ran a study uh, on all, nearly 3,000 North American consumers that had at least 50,000 in financial assets uh, to invest. And we had them participate in an online simulated investment decision-making exercise. And for some of the participants, we, had, we gave them advice in more of the traditional approach, more of the traditional way. And for some of the clients, we talked about we presented that information through behavioral coaching means. So embedding some of the tactics that we're gonna talk about later in this presentation uh, and more into that advice. And what we found in terms of their simulated investings is we actually had better outcomes for the clients. So they were more likely to adhere to the plan that was provided to them as evidenced by a more optimal asset allocation. They were more likely to select better diversified portfolios and they achieved a superior sharp ratio. It also pointed to better outcomes for advisors in that clients felt greater trust for the advisor. They were more likely, they indicated that they would be more likely to consult a financial advisor in the future. And they saw greater perceived benefits of working with a financial advisors. So this is one of those approaches that really is a win-win scenario in which it provides better outcomes for the clients it also builds a better relationship between yourself and those clients so that you can have a stronger long-term impact on their outcomes. Now let's start to think about what behavioral economics, behavioral finance really is. So if we move, move to the next slide, the, the question that I always like to start with here when we think about what behavioral finance is, is to take a step back and think about how we really make decisions. Now, Marshall in his intro referenced uh, the idea of making decisions in a rational way. When, we when it comes to finance in particular, we tend to think of how we make decisions as being very calculated. Maybe you create an Excel sheet, maybe you don't, but you tend to assume that you bring together all of the information you have available to you, weigh the pros and cons, and make a decision that is rational. The challenge with that type of decision-making is that it takes an incredible amount of effort. And even when you have a lot of information available to you, that can be very overwhelming and very difficult to amalgamate and put together. So in reality, the way we make decisions most of the time is to make decisions that are good enough. Now, for most of the time, that's actually okay. It gets us to a reasonable decision, but making decisions that way, relying on shortcuts, heuristics, uh, 
rules of thumbs that allow us to get to decisions much quicker or even relying on emotions, which can be a very strong and good indicator of what our preferences are, it leaves us open to cognitive bias. It leaves us open to scenarios in which that way of making decisions can actually lead to suboptimal decisions. So let's look at an example of what I mean by cognitive bias and, and how that might impact our decisions. So if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna start with a very simple coffee scenario, coffee example. Now, if you, like me, tend to buy your coffee at the local coffee shop, uh, you have a selection of sizes. We're gonna simplify this. A lot of places now have, you know, your extra small all the way up to your extra large, but we're gonna simplify it to a set of three options, small, medium, and large. Now it turns out most people actually order a medium cup of coffee. That's what most people prefer. This is kind of an interesting phenomenon. And so a, a researcher at the University of Toronto, Dilip Soman, uh, noticed this and decided to run an experiment. What he did is for the first week within a, within a live coffee shop, him and his researchers observed behavior, noted how many people ordered a medium coffee, and asked people as they were leaving the coffee shop, why did you select the medium cup of coffee? And what he found is that most people, when they ordered the medium said, oh, it's just the right size. It's not too little, it's not too much. It's exactly what I want. It's sort of the, the standard Goldilocks type explanation. Now, the week following, he was a little bit sneaky and had the coffee shop increase the sizes by two ounces each. So now the small was the same size that the medium was a week prior, but everything moved up by two ounces. And again, he observed the behavior and asked people as they were leaving the coffee shop why, why they ordered what they did. He found again, most people still ordered the medium size of coffee. They didn't downsize or adjust based on the volume. And when he asked them why, they did this, they gave the same explanation as the week prior. So they didn't say something like you might expect, which is, oh, well now I'm getting two ounces more for the same price, that's a great deal, right? No, instead they still said, oh, it's not too much, it's not too little, it's just the right amount. Giving us an indication that people are using the context, the options that are presented beside the all together to guide their decision. They're not necessarily making a fully rational decision about, the exact quantity of coffee that is perfect for them, that's optimized for their day. They're going with, I always order a medium. Medium feels like the right amount. I don't have any issues with it. I'm gonna to continue to order that medium. Now, when it comes to coffee, that probably doesn't matter all that much, right? An extra two ounces of coffee or two ounces less of coffee in your day is probably not even gonna really have much of an impact on your overall well being or long term outcomes of, of caffeine consumption, right? So again, so this is one of those scenarios where this is a very quick way of making a decision that is good enough. It probably has very little impact on your day-to-day -day life. And so it's simple, you can move on with your day. But this can extend to other scenarios that might have a larger impact on what you're doing. So at BE Works, we ran another study. And if we move to, to the next slide, and bear with me on this slide, I know there's a lot of, a lot of information here. Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm trying to present all three options at once for us. Uh, but what we found, what we did was look at a risk assessment scenario, right? So we presented uh, a group of participants with one of these risk assessment portfolios where they were presented with four options. Uh, so they either saw the options in the baseline condition, the options in the low risk decoy conditions or in the high risk decoy conditions. And they were asked to select what portfolio would you be comfortable with, right? What level of risk would you be comfortable with? And this is a, a fairly standard practice when we're looking at risk assessment, understanding what our client's risk appetite is, really is. And I'm gonna start with the baseline condition here and explain exactly what we did, what the difference is between these portfolios. So starting with the baseline condition, you can see there's four options. Uh, and there's relatively equal distribution of people selecting those funds. What you might notice, we're gonna go with the middle preference as I was describing, because this is analogous to the coffee scenario, um, that when you look at fund B and fund C, you're looking at about 56% uh, of people select those two middle options. And then you've got fewer people, about 20 to 30% selecting either the most uh, low risk or the most high risk option. In the low risk decoy scenario, we removed 
the highest risk SNP portfolio from the baseline and added an ultra low risk portfolio. In the high risk decoy, we did the opposite. So we removed the lowest risk portfolio and added an ultra high risk portfolio. And the question we were asking is when you, in the low, for, in the low risk decoy scenario, when you remove that high risk scenario, do people who previously would have selected fund D all select, all sort of cluster into fund C? So now you might expect a higher percentage of people, you might expect what we would call a skewed a skewed distribution where a higher percent of people are selecting the two the highest risk scenario highest risk portfolio in the low risk decoy scenario and the opposite would be true in the high risk where you would expect a clustering around the lowest risk because you've taken away that lower risk this is what you would expect if people are choosing truly based on their risk appetite and not based on the options that are presented in front of them now of course if we go to the next slide you can see how this plays out. So what happens? What we don't see in the low risk decoy, what we don't see is about 50% of people selecting that, that highest risk portfolio. Instead, we see a shift where everybody moves down. You're still around 60% for those two middle options with about 20% on either end. The same is true of the high risk decoy. So you, you're not seeing suddenly 40 to 50% of people selecting the lowest risk option. Instead, you're seeing around 60% of people selecting that fund B and fund C with around 20% of people selecting on this, those tails. So this gives us a fairly strong ind indication that middle preference is having a play here, even when we're talking about something as serious as risk appetite. And it's important to keep this in mind when we're dealing with clients. The way we present information impacts what their responses are, how they respond to us. Now, this is a concept that we like to call choice architecture. It might be one you've heard of before. The idea behind choice architecture, and we can go to the next slide here. The idea behind choice architecture is that the environment in which we make a decision impacts the decisions that we make, right? Classic example is at a restaurant. If you go to a sit down meal, sit down meal at a restaurant versus if you go to a buffet, uh, I'm almost, Absolutely certain that nobody here has ordered a second entree at a sit down meal, but probably a good percentage of people have gone up for a second plate at a buffet, right? There is a very strong impact of the context. There's a, there's a number of reasons why that happens. There's a lot of social norms, there's the environment, uh, but those are very clearly different contexts that influence how we choose and what we do, right? The reality is biases don't go away, right? the choice architecture is never neutral. It doesn't matter if it, it has been designed intentionally or unintentionally, that environment is still impacting how people make decisions. Now, the way you design, the way you present information can help reduce bias, or if, it, if it's done badly, can actually increase that bias depending on how you've done it. So that's why it's really important to be aware of these types of biases understand how they might impact clients so that you can better design the choice architecture, the way you're presenting information to help really help people really make the best decisions for them. Now, I quickly just want to touch on the next slide on a number of different biases you may or may not be familiar with. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these. I think Brian is going to talk about a couple of them later on. The two I'm going to speak about right now are the licensing effect, and the overconfidence bias. And I just wanna give, use these as examples of the types of biases people encounter and to start to set up the idea of how you might be aware of those uh, and incorporate that into your practice to present information a little bit differently or use tactics that might help people get to better outcomes. So let's start with the licensing effect on the next slide. Now, the licensing effect is essentially a psychological excuse to engage in behavior that's not optimal. Okay, what does that mean? So <laughs> this the study that I have presented here uh, is, a, is a lab scenario in which they invited participants into the lab. They gave them a scenario uh, and they had them select an object. So at the end of the scenario, they were either able to select a utility object, a vacuum cleaner, or a luxury object designer jeans, and, and they were roughly the same price. Now at the start, what they were told for half of the participants, they were told 
you know, imagine in the past week you participated in uh, three hours of community service. Now, this following week, you have the opportunity to, to select one of these two objects. You imagine you need both of the objects. Which one would you choose? In the other scenario, in the control scenario, they weren't told anything about what they had done the week prior. So they were simply brought in and asked if you were given a choice, assuming you needed both of these two things, what would you select, a vacuum cleaner or designer jeans? And what we see is in the control condition, people are more likely to select the utility item, the vacuum cleaner. And in the community service condition, they're actually slightly more li likely to select the designer jeans, the luxury items. This gives us an indication that people use what they've done in the past to influence the idea of treating themselves or giving themselves something a little bit nicer instead of always going with the utility option. Now, other scenarios that you can think of that might be fairly straightforward where this happens uh, could be um, things like going to the gym and then taking the elevator after afterwards to get back down to your car, right? You've done the good thing already. Now you have just a little bit more license to do something, uh, something else, something that doesn't necessarily match your overall overall goals. When it comes to financial planning, this can be really important in terms of thinking about how people are going to give themselves license, both in terms of spending, but also in terms of following through on plans. So if you have somebody who is looking, who's early on in their journey, who's looking for a financial plan, the simple act of going through the process, reaching out to an advisor, just getting the plan developed might feel good enough to them, might feel like they've accomplished a goal and give them license to not necessarily follow through on that plan, right? It gives them that little bit of leeway to say, oh, I did the thing I needed to do. I can maybe be a little bit relaxed in, in what I do next, right? I have a little bit of time before I actually need to do anything. So it's important to keep that in mind and, and potentially make sure that the way the plan is delivered doesn't feel like an outcome, doesn't feel like the, the reward in and of itself to help guide clients to that longer term view, making sure they're not taking that licensing, that license to, to I guess, lightly misbehave as it might be the right way to put that. Now, the other one I want to talk about on, on the next slide is the concept of overconfidence. Now, I, I know we're all familiar with overconfidence. I'm sure lots of us have encountered people who are, who are overconfident. Maybe, maybe we're all a little bit overconfident uh, ourselves at times as well. I, I know certainly I, I have done this before in the past. Um, but overconfidence, when we think about it in terms of a bias, is quite simply that there's a difference between what people actually know and what they think they know. So when we assess this, when we measure this, the, the delta between asking somebody, how well do you understand financial principles, having them give a rating on that type of a question versus giving them an actual quiz, asking them direct questions, having them answer, answer those items and assessing their knowledge in an objective way. The delta between those two things gives you an indication of what their overconfidence is. Now, what's interesting about overconfidence is the best way to overcome it is to actually provide them with that objective measure, to provide them with that test. The act of going through a series of questions when you can subjectively experience not knowing the answer, right? So seeing it, realizing, oh, this might be more complicated, there might be more to this than I considered, helps correct for overconfidence. Now, I wouldn't suggest necessarily presenting clients with quizzes on a regular basis. That's not necessarily the best customer experience or, or journey experience. But there are ways to ask people questions to help them have that experience of uncertainty that helps correct for their overconfidence, particularly at key times when they're maybe making a decision around where they might want to invest or whether or not they want to sell that they feel really confident about. But you know, if you ask a series of, of quick questions, have them reflect on it a little bit, can help correct for that overconfidence. Ultimately, we, and we can flip to the next slide now. Ultimately, really what we want to share today is that understanding the psychological factors that influence how people make financial decisions 
is the first step in helping clients achieve financial success. So understanding these factors, starting to incorporate them into, the, into their practice is really critical for that success. And I'll hand it over now to Brian, who's gonna talk a little bit more in detail about how to apply behavioral science throughout the client journey. Thank you, Shannon. Now you've got me questioning because I'm always getting the second entree and I always get the large copy. So that's a whole separate discussion, maybe another diagnostic moment. Well, <laughs> yeah, we'll have that conversation later. Oh, but yeah, thank you. So next slide, please. So how do we put this all together? You know, this is what I like to call redefining engagement. You know, if we take a look at the normal client model from prospect to client goal achievement, you know, we could spend hours on each of these and really barely scratch the surface as far as what is evolving when it comes to behavioral science and how to implement. But that said, I want to start with prospecting you know, what I like to call client acquisition. If we look over the last 20 plus years, you know, we initially started off with a more product portfolio focus. Then we evolved to a goals values base and now towards a, what we call a holistic, which has kind of been the norm today. You know, I grew up with the old Bacharach values-based planning and, you know, really enjoyed that moment of that. But what I thought was a niche and an edge at one time now is a pretty common thing. So that said, you know, it's been a race to level the playing field in many respects. And what we do is we often rely on marketing or education to help differentiate. So if we look at marketing, you know, itself, it's seen a similar shift over the last few decades, you know, starting off with more of that cultural demographic approach. And then evolving to a persona base. And now, you know, we see a lot of hyper-personalized, which can vary significantly from firm to firm. And so, but overall, it's still been more of that one size fits all. So if we take a moment, and I like to throw this out as an analogy, is say, take Shannon, myself, Michael Jordan, and Shakira. If we take the marketing team, they may look at this as there's four completely separate personas or people or individuals maybe from a cultural or a persona-based segment, but behaviorally, we may in fact be the same person. We may approach things the same way. And so this is what's really led to behavioral segmentation approach, which we'll save that one for another time. But what I wanna focus on today when it comes to that initial engagement around client acquisition is, for me, it's really around trust and confidence throughout the entire engagement process. Now, I wanna preface this, this is, my belief versus fact, there's multiple ways to approach it. I don't believe in a good, bad, right, or wrong. I believe in what works for the individual. But that said, how I like to look at it is from the point of view of both the client and from the advisor in trust and confidence. So we've been great financial firms for decades at focusing on delivering content to help build trust and confidence from our side. But what about the clients? How can we help them build trust and confidence in themselves? Now, we're going to cover that in a moment. But if we move to the next step around onboarding, you know, for a lot of individuals, you know, we, that's the paperwork, the fact finder, the discovery side of things, go through a risk tolerance. And of course, it's building that relationship and really where it started. That said, for many, it's an exercise that we go through so we can get to the close and really want to focus on how can we help from the advisor perspective to build that relationship around trust and confidence. And then finally, client retention. You know, this is where engagement continues. We build rapport, trust over time. But there's been, again, a lot of changes in behavioral would allow us to now focus on behavioral segmentation. So how do we deliver the right content at the right moment, whether that's an education piece, a marketing piece? You know, we talk a lot about next best, next best action because we don't go from, all right, meet to sale. Yes, that happens. But a majority of time, it's a three, four, five step process, depending. And so what is that next best behavioral action? How can we get them from where they are today to where they want to go? Next slide, please. So if we start with the advisor perspective, you know, we talk about creating a great plan and then all of a sudden, what's the gap? Why don't we stick to it? Where's the follow through on that? And there's a multitude of different ways. And there's a lot of stats I've seen upwards of 50 to 60 percent don't follow through on plans. And again, this could be a week long workshop just to cover chapter one. But if we think about it through our own lens, what I like to look at is the thought action gap. Why do we do what we do? So, for example, you know, I'm eating healthy. I want to start working out again. So I know that I'm going to have the pizza or salad. Sorry. I want to have the salad. However, one o'clock comes around, I'm busy and I grab the pizza. Why did I do that? I have the best intention of working out. I've written it down. I've got my goals. I've got my journal, all that stuff. However, I get busy. Something happens and next thing I go to the pizza. Well, it's because what goes on in here between our ears. And that's the thing is how do we close that gap? From the advisor perspective, I like to break it down to a couple simple steps. You know, starting with engage, initial engagement, really it's about setting the stage. You know, giving permission. 
I start all conversations with initial meeting. There's no good, bad, no right or wrong. And that's really important for me because so often we set it up in a way where we create this parent-child relationship and it leads to a missing out on what's really going on. The second is environment. You know, this is something where if I come into an office environment where I'm sitting behind a desk, that can create one experience. You know, for myself personally, I've always been the Dr. Seuss style office. It's still a dream for me and I still can't get my team to build that yet, but something to make it comfortable and enjoyable. You know, then we get into the discovery process. For many of this, many of us, we do take the couple, spouse or partners together, and we take them down a journey together. But they have a separate journey and they have a together journey. So how can we split that up and really help to understand both the CFO spouse and the non-CFO spouse or partner, especially when it comes to risk tolerance? This is an area where, you know, so often most of us, we hand out a risk tolerance, we sit down, they sit down, go through it together. It's usually the CFO spouse that ends up completing it for the non-CFO spouse. You may get a few head nods and things like that. However, that's the end of discussion as part of that necessary process. That said, one simple step and really helping to understand how someone thinks behaviorally is simply have them do, have them do that as a separate exercise and then see where they are. Are they together? And this can provide a really good, what I call the why discussion phase on why they do something. And then spending more time on the why. You know, a lot of times we put together a plan, we all agree to it, we set it in motion, but then something happens, right? Every plan is gonna have mistakes. Every plan is gonna have something that goes wrong. That's just human nature. That said, we usually do the finger pointing. Well, all right, why did this break? Let's fix it. Instead of really understanding the why behind it to think about from a behavioral standpoint, are there certain things that are going on again between their head that, that's really leading them down this path? And so then the final is transparency. This is something that for me has been so key. And we talk a lot, and I know you'll see a lot of discussion now, especially around behavioral, when we talk a lot about nudges, right? And nudges do have a purpose and a point, but the thing is a nudge is great when you're using it for one time, one and done. However, when you're building a relationship, transparency plays a very critical factor in there. And so really focusing on transparency to help build trust from our side. So again, now how do we help clients build and you know help them to understand how they think behaviorally when they make financial decisions? Next slide, please. So now from the client's point of view, Clients sitting in front and we talk a lot about ideal self versus real self, right? We all have an image of who we think we are, who we want to be when we're presenting ourselves to other people. We always want to look good. We've got to get it right. That's just human nature in itself. The problem is when we do that, sometimes we end up putting on what I will say is a little bit of a front because it depends on who we're in front of. If I'm sitting in front of an advisor, well, I've got to look good, look like I've got my, excuse my legs, my shit together, and I really may want to impress them a little bit. Guys, we tend to suffer from that quite a bit more. You know, That said is, how do we break that down to help the client really understand what their real self or who their real self is? And really, what I like to say, give them permission to get messy. They don't have to get it right. Um, you know, One of the topics that I cover when working with Founder Institute is we actually have initial founders, we sit through this exercise where have them stand up and say, yeah, I messed up, yeah, I messed up and get comfortable with getting messy. Now, why is that critical? Because if we're only focused on getting it right, we really can't get true insight into what's going on in their head, how they're thinking. And so often what happens is we get the, what I call the, I don't know answer, right? So, you know, this is something that, again, advisor client relationship, we tend to want to give them an out. And so we usually lead with, all right, well here, how about this? Or how about that? To try and make it easier on them. One of the things that I like to do is if you didn't know, what would it be? And it's given them that permission to actually get it wrong. And most of the time they actually do have it right. But the big key is, is we've got to really focus on how do we get clear inside their head and this not a good, bad, right or wrong, redefine engagement from the standpoint of it's really important for us to help them to understand how they think behaviorally when they make financial decisions, because going to trust and confidence, right? So we look at a relationship and taking a client through the process of journey. It's really about building trust and confidence, not just in the advisor to the client, but actually the client in themselves. Because if I'm the client and I don't trust myself in the decisions that I'm making or don't have confidence in it, that's going to lead to the hesitation of either implementing parts of the plan or following through with that plan, or quite frankly, having a very frank, real discussion with that advisor as far as here's where I am, here are the things that are getting in my way. And so next slide, please. So in wrapping up, how do we put this into practice? Well, 
few simple ways. I know Shannon touched on overconfidence, and I just want to spend a little bit more time on that. But, you know, if we look at, quite frankly, most of us that are in the financial field, we have to have some level of overconfidence. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be where we are today. And so it's not in itself a good, bad, right or wrong thing, you know, and I think that's something that really want to be mindful of. And again, this is my belief, not fact, but we tend to do a lot of finger pointing. Here's your problem because we want to fix it and move to the solution very fast. However, this is who we are. This is how I think behaviorally when I make decisions. And to change that, and there's a lot of you know, research books and things on changing behaviors and stuff. Yes, some people can, and over time. However, majority of us, we are who we are. So how do we work with what we have to be able to get them from point A to achieving the outcome that they want to achieve? And so it's really having an understanding as far as what their background is. You know, were they an entrepreneur? Were they a small business owner? Were they an advisor? Chances are, you know, to survive in that, they probably have a higher level of overconfidence. Understanding some past decisions, you know, we focus a lot on the investment side, but sometimes it's taking them outside of the investment to get them to open up and share a little bit about, maybe it's a business they started, maybe it's a venture, maybe it's how they met their spouse or partner and understanding a little bit around that. But if we can understand how they think behaviorally when they make those financial decisions, and then when we're sitting down, whether that's an insurance or an investment solution that we're placing for them, is really understand when they make that decision to follow through, whether that's to buy, hold, sell, to trade, it's really understanding what can get in the way. And so with overconfidence, you know, I'd like to, what I like to do is use what I call a decision journal to look at past decisions. And that's a real simple exercise where you can take them through real quick to just understand some of the past. The other is, is playing devil's advocate or do a pre-mortem, right? So we've put this great plan together, but what can go wrong? Let's talk about that. Let's play devil's advocate and look at how things are going to fall through. And it's not from a good or bad and I think some of us get uncomfortable with doing that because we're worried that if we do that, then they may not move forward with us. But the problem is that may be the case. And if that's the case, then that means we're not on the same page with them. But if we can actually get on that same page, and we all say we do that, however, a significant portion we still do not. But if we can get on the same page, then five years, 10 years down the road, we're actually able to make sure that that plan follows through. And so simple things around overconfidence, again, decision journal, look at their past decisions, look in both investment, but also take it outside of that to get a better understanding of how they think. The other is, is really around pre-mortem or playing devil's advocate. You know, that's something that, because we all know, I mean, obviously the market is going to go up, it's going to go down. That's the one fact we can't state. When it does, what do you do? And really try to understand that. And then the next one is loss aversion. For so long, we group loss aversion and risk together. We tend to think of them as one. And it's interesting because uh, one of my former advisors, a significant seven-figure producer, very good guy. However, he had a little bit of a gambling problem. And in his gambling problem, he was not playing to win. He was doubling down and playing not to lose. And so why is that important? Because if we do a regular risk tolerance, we understand, yeah, he's a pretty highly risk individual. He does well, so everything's okay. That said, a bulk of his time and stress was focusing on the decisions that he made. In the past, he grew up in a you know, not so uh, affluent family and his wife was, came from a very affluent family. So there was this, not to say inadequacy, but he was really trying to compete. And so he was constantly making bets, constantly gambling to really focus on how do I get to that quick buck, if you will, and it never happened. And he, you know, what we realized in this discussion by separating loss aversion and risk is the fact that he was the individual who was playing not to lose as opposed to playing to win. So, you know, how do you understand it? Again, going back and looking at past investment decisions, looking at past decisions they've made in businesses, right? And trying to understand and what do they focus on when things do go sideways? You know, if they focus on the good, the bad, are they those individuals that are really negative and, you know, again, playing not to win or playing, sorry, playing not to lose as opposed to playing to win. If we can understand it over time and building the relationship, it makes it a lot easier for us in you know, understanding this is what we need to walk them through behaviorally to help them to understand where they're at. So with that, you know, want to open it up for questions or turn it back to you, Marshall. And uh, I want to say, you know, I need to cut my bio down just a little bit because that's like... <laughs> Well, for you, I apologize. And one final thing before I turn it over, I have to do this, and I'm sorry, but being Croatian, we play you guys, and I'm, you guys are in our So good luck. I'm excited. I, I would love to see Canada make it. I'm definitely going for Canada over the U.S., so you know, but Croatia, being Croatian is number one for me. But uh, good luck. <laughs> 27th, we will see each other. Okay. All right. Well, 
uh, good luck to uh, Croatia and uh, I know we're all we're all watching that carefully. So anyway, thank you so much. That was a great a great presentation. Uh, yeah, please um, uh, post your questions uh, in the Q and A uh, um, screen at the bottom, and uh, we'll ask uh, our experts. Um, I could start things off. There's a few questions here, but I'll maybe start things off, and, and just as an indication of how much ingrained the study of behavioral finance has sort of become in the, in the investment community. I know the Ontario Securities Commission a few years ago published a, a report on behavioral uh, insights and um, and particularly as it, as it relates to to regulatory considerations and and more recently has uh, formed sort of a testing lab with a number of companies uh, all designed to ultimately improve client interactions i know both your organizations have been involved in the in the testing lab to some extent just wondering if you could describe a little bit of kind of what's happening there um in, in those testing labs sure um, I'll, I'll start Shannon, if that's okay i mean this is one thing that it's an amazing program and i've got to say that again coming from the us this is something that is blown away because regulatory bodies here are not quite as uh, open-minded to things so congrats to the osc that said with test lab and innovations really there's two problems that they're looking at is number one is kyp know your pro product and number two is kyc know your client how do we redefine that you know and if we look at a standard risk tolerance you know, so often when an individual is answering that, we have such a limited amount of information, yet we're asked to make a decision, would I buy, hold, sell? And so, you know, this is something for a lot, unfortunately, it's become an exercise of, well, you're my advisor, you figure it out, or, oh, we, we're going to go with X. And in reality, that's not where they're aligned. So really the focus now is we'd like to flip it on its head instead of KYC, CKY, client know yourself. And so this is where we begin looking at how to apply behavioral science to help the client understand themselves better and then apply that to the risk tolerance itself to have a better insight and understanding. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so there's a number of questions now. Um, first one, is there, a, is there a difference in decision-making during, during an appointment at the client's home versus in the advisor's office? If so, what bias should be considered in each setting? I'll start with a different Shannon. You cover the biases. <laughs> sure, you know, that sounds good. It really is, you know. And I, and I think this is something. Again, we look at that relationship and that initial engagement, and and just put yourself into their shoes for a second. Or when you go into a meeting, maybe with your banker or a mortgage broker or someone else, there's that desk in between us, and it automatically frames things from the context of all right, I'm sitting in front of someone. Again, I say human nature. We have to look good. And that does come through. And so things that we can do to reduce that, you know, things if they do have to come into the office, sitting in a circular table where we sit at a 90 degree instead of, you know, on the opposite side, there's little things like that. What you see in an office, you know, if you have someone with a lot of trophies, awards, and that individual comes from more of an artistic background, that could create an issue. So that's where I like to keep things in this neutral, non potentially judgmental and objective format as possible. But I'm, you know, I love sitting at the kitchen table and, and maybe try this a little bit. You know, when you go to their home for dinner or a conversation, the conversations that actually come up are much more personal in nature. They open up to you and share because this is their home environment. They're proud of that. So I'll, I'll maybe I'll jump in there. I mean, I absolutely agree with Brian. There's definitely a difference, right? Um, I think that social desirability that Brian's pointing to is a big one. The other thing to consider in the office is that there's more time pressure. And we know when there's more time pressure, people are a little bit more reliant on those shortcuts and heuristics because they don't necessarily have all of the bandwidth to, to make that more rational choice. So they're gonna rely more on that expert opinion. Uh, they're gonna rely on that social, appearing socially desirable. Uh, they might be influenced a little bit more strongly by emotions because they're in that moment, they're gonna use that as a, as a strong cue or things like availability bias. So what they can think of quickly, what they're, you know, what they're reflecting on what's happened in the past, that's gonna be more likely to influence uh, what their choice is. Now that's not to say they're bias free at home, right? So when they go home, there's other biases that that influence them there. Um, some of them are quite, you know, I, I, I hesitate to call this a bias, but something like you're going to be more influenced by 
external factors. So whether it is family and friends, which might actually be a very good thing, that might it might be important to have that conversation with a, a partner or spouse, uh, but it could also be things like online experts and going and, and doing that search on your own and potentially even leading to somebody to be a little bit more overconfident because they feel like they've done the research themselves, even if they haven't necessarily done as much research as they maybe should have. Great, thank you. Um... The question, uh, Shannon, I think earlier you showed a slide uh, which which um, showed that focusing on savings and investment was perhaps as important or more important than portfolio creation. Yeah. The question is, is there a study or some research that's been done that would point in that direction? Excellent. That's a great question. So I don't believe there's actually a direct study that uh, has been done with, with those outcomes. Uh, where that question comes from is actually from our one of our co-founders, Dan Ariely, who, if you're familiar with behavioral finance and behavioral economics, is probably likely a name that will be familiar to you. Uh, of course, he wrote Predictably Irrational and a, and a number of other books. Uh, he always likes to start uh, talking with advisors about this question. And what he finds is when he asks that question and actually gets them to answer it, most people will select the savings options. Most people will indicate that that's ultimately going to have a bigger outcome. As I said at the start, it's not, a, it's not perfect. It's not 100%. There's certainly scenarios in which optimizing the portfolio is potentially going to have a bigger outcome. It might depend on what initial assets that person has to begin with as well. Um, but for the most part, for your average person, that is going to be at least equally important, making sure they're allocating enough funds into those investments. Okay, great. Um, so next question, when you talk about asking and clarifying, what are some sample questions that we could ask about a client's behavioral biases to better understand risk aversion, risk tolerance, et cetera? I'll start in the Shannon follow up. You know, I, I think one of the things to remember is we don't want to interrogate. And I, I think this is something that we really look at when we ask questions. There's asking questions from a, what I call a general curiosity sake, and there's asking questions as part of an exercise to complete a task. There's a vast difference between the two. If we can think back to when we were the two-year-old kid and we used to go, why, why, why? That's where I, and as my partner teases me, I have yet to grow up from at 48, and I know more about my mother-in-law than he does. But that said, that general curiosity in how to ask. So where I like to start, because if I just look at Shannon and say, all right, so tell me about this time, it's obviously that's more of an interrogation as opposed to curiosity. So I like to look at past decisions as I get to learn about someone. And in those past decisions, there's the digging deeper in different levels. And so if I'm looking at past decisions that they may have made in working with an advisor or in a, you know, a decision that they made in their retirement plan that stands out to them and why, understanding there and start and then trying to get a back history. One thing I'll, I'll finish with before turning over to Shannon uh, is that I like to do what I call as the what else scenario. And this is something where when the client speaks, we tend to stop at that first statement and then dissect that. What I like to do is the what else, what else, what else, what else, and let them keep speaking. When there's a pause, I always count to at least 20 to 30. I know it's uncomfortable, but that gives them permission to keep going because initially they usually want to give the shortest, most simple answer so they can move on. Some of it is also from that they want to look good. Again, getting at that heart of the real self. So if we can start with that and then just keep moving on, and usually three or four layers down is when you start to find the real truth. Then you can come back and understand each of those areas around there. But that's one of the areas. And I think the biggest thing is, and I can't stress this enough, and it probably beat it you know, to death, is non-judgmental, come in with a curiosity. And it's really that we say seeking to understand without judgment is so critical in this and getting them to open up. All right. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, I would just add, you know, maybe just building on that what else approach that Brian's talking about is if you ask a question one time, you will get one answer, right? Now that sounds very obvious, but that one answer is gonna be influenced by how you ask that question. So if you ask the same basic question multiple times, but in different ways, you're gonna to start to see, you're gonna to start to actually pinpoint what the actual answer is, right? Because you can shift the way in which you are directing people. So an example might be in that risk risk portfolio assessment example that I showed, um, actually giving them multiple opportunities to select a portfolio under different conditions and seeing how they're responding over time. You might not do that one after another after another because that can influence it, but bringing it back up, revisiting it, 
asking the what else question so that you start to get closer to the actual answer and can start to get a clearer picture of what's really going on. Great, thank you. Uh, so next question. Uh, how do you suggest helping people through the bias of latching onto a market value high point? They feel a loss, but in re reality are still in a profit just below the high they had previously achieved. Again, I'll start on this one. I think, you know, it really starts with is understanding their past experience. And that's something to really look at. Uh, case in point, if one of my former advisors that came from a big financial planning firm and, you know, back she was there at the old firm back in the 08, 09 experience. And so that experience actually anchored her, which is, again, one of the key behavioral traits that throughout the entire time. So every decision that she had made with her clients, she was pulling that 08, 09 decision into. So it starts with, again, I like to look at past experience and again, break it down to simple and understand how they approached it non-judgmentally and, and I know again I keep beating this but it is so key in that sense but understanding at that moment what what made them make that decision and that's okay why in trying to understand that how did they feel before after what do they like and I, this is one of the things I like to say what do you like what would you change if you could because so often when we say what don't you like and we lead with that like even if it's working with another advisor well what didn't you like you automatically set up this negative tone. I like to look at it from a, what do you like about this? Because everything has a good and bad, I believe. You know, But then what would you change if you could? And so understanding that past decisions that they made and really looking at that, that goes back to that decision journal. You know, And that's something if someone with a higher level of overconfidence, this might be a little bit more of a pull and challenge. You know, Someone that's just unsure around things or higher loss aversion, this is going to be more of an education. So that's another thing. How do you approach someone that one size fits all? You know, some you may want to challenge a little bit, you know, some you may want to educate and nurture along to help them to understand through that. Yeah, the other the other thing I would think about in that scenario is how you're presenting the information, right? So a lot of people, when they're latching on to a specific number, we might, we might actually call that anchoring, right? They've been anchored to this number. And when they're just relying on memory, it's very salient to them. If you present the information, so if you present that investment stock on a time frame of a week, a month, you get very different, a year, three years, you get very different pictures, right? And then if you map that against what the overall market is doing, you also get very different, a, di a very different picture. And I think we sometimes assume people will take that holistic view and think about it in that broader context. That's usually not what they're doing. If you display the information in a way that helps them do that, so showing the full time frame in which they've held that investment and also putting it against the broader market conditions, they start to see that those ups and downs, even if they're down, but still at an, they, it starts to become more salient that they're still up, but also that the overall trajectory is likely to continue going up. So they're likely to still recover from that loss, right? So the way that information is framed can really impact how they're anchoring it. And just relying on memory is particular is going to make that anchor particularly salient. Great. Thank you. Um, here's a good question. Do you find a lot of cultural idiosyncrasies with behavioral science or finance? I, I will say being Croatian, and that's the fact that we, you know, getting the Croatian to invest at least a Croatian Croatian is dominant and possible. And I look at my own family situation, that's it. But the one thing I want to say in that, while yes, they can exist, again, don't focus or never assume. However, because things are much more dynamic than we, you know, we give credit to, right? And we think, well, this is the way one does. We like things that fit in a nice, easy box, right? Because when we can put things into a box, it makes it easier for us. Just like if we go back to marketing, cultural markets, demographic, persona-based marketing, it's nice because we know Shannon is X, this is how I deal with her. It makes it simple. However, with behavioral science, it's usually two to three layers behind that. And again, as I used the earlier example between Shakira, you know, Michael Jordan and, and us, we could be the same person in there. And so that's one thing is, yes, you can have it in the back of your head and guaranteed it is sitting there in the back of our head in our unconscious mind, because that's how we're wired. But really look at it as each individual, I go in neutral blank slate, which is as I get older, that's easier for me. Yeah, so when we look at the overall research, the reality is a lot of research done in behavioral finance and behavioral economics has been done on a, a very specific population, right? It's mostly North American. It's what in psychology we call weird participants. So westernized, 
uh, educated, industrial, I forget the rest of the, <laughs> what that acronym is, but by and large, it is university students because that's the population that academics have available to them. And then, and then North American investors is tends to be where that, that research falls. There are research, there is research that's done looking at cross-cultural references. And I think certainly when you look at behavioral science as a whole, it's very clear that there are certain things like social norms, like cultural expectations, they're absolutely expected to influence people's decisions. And so as Brian is saying, looking at somebody as an, as an individual, keeping in mind, there's likely some commonalities, things like anchoring, things like loss aversion that are going to extend across cultures, but there's absolutely going to be nuances within cultures as well. Great, thank you. Um... Here's another question. I have read that disclosure of fees, conflicts of interest, et cetera, increases trust between client and advisor. Can you discuss this and whether there is a behavioral explanation? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in there. That's something that, that at BE Works we've been looking at as well. And in general, that is the trend that we've seen. Now, the way you present that information can have an impact. So if it's presented in a way that is confusing, frustrating to follow, um, unclear, that may not increase trust, right? There's a level of transparency. So this is generally what we call the transparency effect, where being very clear and direct with clients actually increases their, light, their, their trust, their confidence in trusting you. Um, there's a few examples of this outside of the financial services space, looking at uh, providing disclosure around doing things like defaults, providing an explanation as to why you've put somebody into a defaulted condition that can actually make them more likely, even though they've been made aware that that's something intended to sway their decision, it actually makes them more likely to follow through on it because they understand the reasoning behind it. That transparency is really important because it feels, we all have this desire uh, to not feel like we're getting swindled, to not feel like we're getting cheated. And if there's some uncertainty in our understanding of why those fees exist, that can degrade trust. Whereas if the transparency is right there, it increases trust. Just to add to that, there's an old model that I like to use around, you know, when I'm presenting solutions or anything, I, I always start with how it works, pros and cons. And it's important for me to go through also, if there's three different solutions we're looking at for college savings or whatever it may be, retirement portfolios, portfolios it's really starting with that. And that's such a key thing is starting with how it works and it, the pieces, if I can't explain it in eighth grade level, then I don't know it well enough. So I always look at everything from that standpoint with my team and that as well. But then, you know, we tend to focus barely on the pros and you know, or barely on the cons and all on the pros being very objective around that. And, you know, then the pulling it back to the client and saying, all right, you know, Mr. Mrs. Client, Mr. Client, what, which do you prefer and why is understanding their rationale behind it is something they can forget it later, but I want to make sure that do they understand it? Because going back to that earlier conversation around building trust and confidence in the client, it's one thing for me to show how great I am. That really doesn't matter. What matters is how can I build trust and confidence in the client for themselves? The more that they understand something, the greater the trust builds in themselves. The more that they understand something, the greater the confidence in themselves that the decision that they're making is right. And while that may not seem like a big deal, if we take it today and we look 10 years down the road, it can be a monumental difference in that relationship and how it's built. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, so just one more very general question. Um, the person who's saying they find the topic fascinating and, and could you recommend any, any book, uh, books for a deeper exploration of the, of the subject matter? I'm sure, I'm sure you can. Oh yeah. I mean, there, yeah. there's lots of, there's lots of books that can be read. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Certainly, certainly uh, I would uh, of course recommend any of the ones by Dan. He does have one, the title escapes me. There is one specific to money. Uh, that's quite good. I also always like to put out Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a heavy read, right? You got to be prepared for yourself. He's he's a trained economist, so he comes from it from that perspective. Uh, but it's it's very good in understanding how people are making decisions. To add to that, all of Dan Ariely's books and Thinking Fast and Slow is great. I recommend you buy it with Nudge. 
The reason being is nudge is a lot easier to read. This, and then you can go between the two because I've had, and, and I love Daniel, but it's like, I've had to put it down and back, put it down. But as you can tell, I'm a little bit of a driver, but nudge is another book um, as well too. Nudge, okay. Okay, that's great. No, just, uh, it's it's just about one o'clock. So I want to thank um, our, our speakers. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon and Brian, for participating in this webinar and providing uh, your, your insights. Um, uh, if um, participants, if you have any additional questions, please email us at designations at csi.ca. A reminder, a replay of this event will be available in the coming days. And for more information on upcoming webinars that CSI will be hosting, uh, please visit our website at csi.ca. And once again, thank you uh, everyone for attending and have a great day. <laughs>